It's so noisy today. Hmm. Well, whatever. <laughs> Why do I keep hearing when people come in? Whatever. Uh, okay. All right. Um, so I guess we'll get started. Um, yeah, I guess we're not meant to be celebrating April Fools and I personally hate it, but um, but this is well, this will be the extent of what I will be doing for April Fools. Uh, so yeah. Okay, so, um, oh, just some admin stuff. Uh, let's see, number one, I posted assignment six, um, which will be on word embeddings. Um, I still need to write the sort of the extra credit question, which will most likely be like read a paper uh, or sort of follow some, some paper. Um, I think it won't be at, I'll sort of extend that deadline. Um, and maybe that will just be the extent of the extra credit. I haven't decided yet. Um, the topic models mini quiz will be released today. Um, so the way that works is it's basically an online quiz through Gradescope, and it'll like it'll be open for like the next two days, um, and then you'll have like an hour. I haven't decided. Probably forty five minutes or an hour to just like when you when you press, you know start the quiz you would then just uh, uh you'll um you start the quiz and then you'll have an hour in which you can do it uh it will be open book obviously because i don't cannot control what you do at home uh so yeah so i so like yeah it's it shouldn't be stressful in the sense of like i will hopefully give you ample time to think the answers through it's not like the quizzes we do in uh, in the actual class where it's like 15 minutes and you need to like you know, be, be very hyper-focused. Okay, so, oops. all right. So today we're gonna finish off language models. Um, yeah. All right, cool. So language models, um, so this sort of, just to recap, uh, I'm sure everyone's been thinking a lot about topic models. Uh, so these are obviously very different. Um, a language model ultimately is an, a way to assign uh, likelihoods to sequences of words, right? Um, oh man, this, this, okay, I need to turn off this notification when people arrive, uh, I'll do it later. <laughs> So, you know, what we said last time was, you know, generally speaking, what we're trying to characterize is this likelihood. Uh, and we know from the law of conditional probabilities, I forgot what it's called, uh, you can basically decompose it in this form, right? And so what we saw last time was, you know, so this, this, is, you know, this is a true equality sign, obviously, you don't want to do this because the number of parameters is going to be basically very, very big. So what you're going to look at is you're going to look at n grams, right? So what we had before, one way we would do was just to look at sort of like the previous one instead, right? So this is known as a biogram. Uh, you could look at none of them, right? You could look at the empty set and that would be what is also known as a bag of words model, right? So you remember when we talked about topic models, a topic model is a bag of words model in the sense that it, it doesn't care about the, you know, 
the um, where the word came along in that article, right? So you sort of just treat it as a bag of words. Each document is just a bag of words, and you sort of, you know, all you care about are the counts of the words. Obviously, that's not a good approximation for a language model because you know, what you care about are sort of like, you know, how these words are going to relate to each other in a sentence. Okay, so that's your sort of quote unquote, like, you know, basic language model using these background models that then correspond to looking at sort of the relative frequencies of the particular pairs of words that you're looking at in, uh, currently, right? So, so this is, would be a particular pair of words. Okay, and then so what we saw last time was that, you know, there are sort of problems with this type of approach where you're, you know, the most naive procedure where you're just looking at counts of words and it's not taking into account the fact that, you know, you have words that are sort of similar in meaning and you sort of want to take advantage of that. Um, and so what we saw last time was you can instead, you can instead of, you know, uh, modeling this prob conditional probability uh, in terms of just relative frequencies, right? You can look instead as sort of like the class-based versions of them, right? So really what's happening here is that in, you know, what we're gonna, the, the, the model that we're gonna take is that we're basically gonna consider classes of words and then look at the probability of classes of words proceeding or following each other, right? So now it's a little bit more uh, sort of crude. You, you now have groupings of words together and you're sort of looking at which, you know, what, what, what group follows what other group, right? And then the question is, well, how do you sort of actually pick these groups? Um, and so we'll see in a little bit. Well, actually, so I said this last time. Um, one key point to make here is that the way you do this is you first essentially assign each class to its own, sorry, each word to its own class, right? So let's be a little bit more explicit here. Where am I? No, still on the first page. Oops, wrong one. Okay, so, you know, what you could do is you could, you know, have your vocabulary of words, right? You know, W, so, sorry, so here, uh, here I might be abusing notation. Oh, someone has a question. Why intuitively is class two conditioned on class one? Um, so, so I mean, so the point of this is that I want to I want to look at these conditional probabilities. I, I want to introduce the class that a word is a part of, right? So remember, what is a class? I mean, we can look back down here. Um, you know, I think the 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 best sort of example of a class here is days of the week, right? So let's just think of that class as the days of the week. So the point here is that you know. If I am looking at word one and word two, right? And I want to predict word two given word one, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to just look at just word one itself. I want to look at sort of, I want to sort of take a high picture and look at the class of word one, right? So so this is sort of saying, what's the probability that given a word in class one? What's the probability that the next word is going to be in class two, right? And then following that, given that I have produced a word in class two, what's the probability that that word is, a is actually going to be word two, right? So really all this is doing is this basically a way to think in terms of like classes being the thing that, that's driving everything, except, you know, the, the, the thing is you have to eventually pick a particular word, right? So with the final W, the final W that you're predicting, you have to pick a word, but everything else is, you just treat them as classes, right? So I hope 
that makes sense. Um, right. So I mean, so yeah. So intuitively, I like to think of this as just um, you know, I'm gonna start looking instead of looking at words, I'm gonna look at classes of words. But the f but the final thing I'm predicting still needs to be a word, right? It has it has to be a word. It can't be a class of words, right? So then there's always this final step that requires me to look at a word chosen from the particular class that I'm going to be guessing. Everything else is just going to be about classes. Okay. So okay. So let's just um, let's look at the. Example, I think, it, which is going to be helpful, is the example where every class is its own word. Okay, um, so so I was going to say here I'm going to uh, I'm going to be a, a little bit abusive of notation. I know this is annoying, but um, so what I want to do here, I'm going to start writing W uh, here as a word in my vocabulary okay so for now i'm just thinking of w you know it's almost like w1 to wv okay so and then you know basically my class of w1 is actually just going to be w1 right so what i'm saying here is that usually what you'll have is you'll have words like you know tuesday could be one word and then i put them into like the weekend class Right, and then I would put week, weekday, sorry, like Tuesday, Wednesday, and they would all go into this class. Now I'm saying my class is actually, each class, each word is gonna be in its own class, the Tuesday class, right? So the number of classes is going to be the, the number of words in your vocabulary, right? So, so then what, what's going to happen is, you know, you think about this TW2 given W1 equals to P of C2 given C1 times P of W2 given C2. Well, that's really just P of W2 given W1 times P of W2 given W2. Right. And here I put quotation marks as in like the class of W2, right? Um, is, is someone, is someone just Piazza? Okay, well, okay, I'm, okay, no, sorry. Let me not worry about Piazza. Um, so, uh, okay, so yeah, so I have the quotation marks here. That basically corresponds to the class, right? And this class is only one element, it's just W2, right? So, Right, so what is, what's this probability? Anyone, everyone? One. Yay, good, okay, yes. Just making sure you're all following. Well, now I only know Curtis is following, but uh, that will suffice. Um, okay, so, so, okay, so essentially, you know, basically what I've done is I've basically reduced this to the, 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 the normal way, right? This is just actually just, I haven't basically, I haven't done anything in, in this sense. Um, but the reason why I wanna bring this up is, uh, so last time I, I, I asked you guys to think about why the, ML, the MLE biogram model uh, has the greatest likelihood. And what that means is why does the relative frequency thing that we've been discussing, um, why does that have the greatest likelihood? Um, so hopefully you guys thought about it. Um, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about this because I think it's, it will be helpful when we go over some mathematical proof in a little bit. Okay. Um, so what, what, what am I trying to say here? You know, what we have, let's just focus on the background model, right? Um, and so we have our likelihood, right? see this the likelihood is just going to be given by our well, log likelihood right it's going to be given by our log p okay so here 
Yeah, OK, so here I'm going to change my notation a little bit because I'm being annoying. Um, well, should I do it? OK, no. Yes, I will. I will do this. OK, so it's going to be T1 to Tn, right? Comma is coming. So this, this is my joint likelihood for T1 to Tn. T1 to Tn is our corpus, is, is our text, is our piece of text that we're trying to figure out the likelihood of, right? Um, and so what I'm saying is, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the likelihood of, of this. If you if you do the biogram model, what happens is you're actually going to have like you know i from one equal to n of probability of t n. Oops, t i given t i minus one. Yeah, and forget about like the this should be a log, right? So forget about the the first one, whatever t t zero is like is is the empty set okay um so so this is you know this is under the biogram model all right so under the biogram model all you need to worry about you decompose your likelihood it's it's going to be in this form because you don't have to go all the way back you just care about the previous word right so what's important to note here is that you can rewrite this in this form. Yep, sorry. Oh, okay, I can, yeah, no, no, I'll, I'll do this. W1, W2, W1, W2, P, oh log of p w2 given w1 okay so what did i just do i mean this is just this is just the general thing you do when you're dealing with likelihoods um if you think about so so t1 to tn here remember that's just a sequence that's just a sequence of words in my corpus right in the street in the extreme case you can think of just like wikipedia right so this is this is every single word in wikipedia in one long line right so n here is like a bajillion no, a billion or whatever right and so i want to you know i want to figure out the likelihood for this um so now i could just do it in this in this way but what you notice you can you know you can basically match up it's equivalent to just looking at all possible pairs of words in my vocabulary Right. And then if I just consider all pairs of words in my vocabulary, then this guy is always always going to be the same if this these two words appear next to each other in a sentence. Right. So all I'm doing is I'm sort of you know collecting all the terms that are basically the same. Right. So this this should be fairly straightforward here. I've basically, you know, this is how you do a lot of things when you're you know, dealing with likelihoods, you're matching the terms together and you're adding up the number of times this is the case, right? So this is the number of times word one and the word two appear next to each other. Uh, and this is W1, W2 across all words in your vocabulary, right? So like, you know, in, in V, right? You can write V squared, whatever. Okay, right? So, so, th so this is really sort of the one, one of the key steps. And then the second thing is, well, now uh, the question, well, so, so yeah, your parameter, your sort of your degrees of freedom here is your choice of this probability, right? Right now, I'm just saying, let's consider a language model that is a biogram. I haven't sort of decided how I'm going to actually, you know, choose the probabilities for this, right? But you should sort of be able to tell, well, you know, you're almost there because if I just rewrite this as, let's say, over n, yeah, maybe it counts over n, yeah, yeah, over n squared, something like that. No. Okay. It, I, it, might, it might, might just be over n, sorry. Um, then you really have this log p w2 over w1. And so what you can sort of see is that you sort of, 
you have a choice of, you have a choice for this, right? And you want to maximize this likelihood choosing these terms. Uh, obviously, you need, you know, you need them to sum up to equal, sum up to one. And so what you get is that you pick the probability such that it matches this. So, so this is this is the negative entropy. You can you can show that the choice of p w one given w two given w one, right? The choice that maximizes this term is given by p w two given w one is really just over. Uh, so okay. So in this case, actually, I did the. I did the math wrong. This 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 should actually be W one. If you do if you do the math that way, then I think it works out. Um, yeah. So okay. So here, so the question is, what is TI and what is WI? Um, yeah. So uh, I I know this is a little bit different from the actual uh, lecture notes, um, but. In, so T corresponds to the actual text you're given, right? So, so T corresponds to the text. Um, w corresponds to the actual words in my vocabulary. Okay. Um, so in particular, if I look at T1 to Tn, there's gonna be multiple words that are the same. W is just, is, 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 a, is a index over my vocabulary. So, so I only look at, you know the word apple once, right? Whereas apple could it could appear in T one, it could appear in T five, T hundred, T fifty, right? So so this is just a, a way to differentiate between the words in my corpus and the words in my vocabulary. Okay. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So. So actually, this was uh, this 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 part is actually I sort of sidestepped uh, a little bit of work here. Um, originally, I had done this calculation for the case where it was just the unigram, so I didn't have this conditional uh, thing, and so the the math is a little bit easier. But uh, it's still the same principle. Um, yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry. So. This what was <laughs> sorry. So what is this? Um, so this is basically the number of times I see W one and W two next to each other in my corpus. Right. Okay. Let. Okay. I'm gonna this. Mm, I'm, I'm gonna redo this and we we'll do this for unigrams. Okay. I think it, it, life is easier for unigrams and then you can extend it yourself for biograms, okay? So for unigram, sorry, I, I, I had unigrams in my notes, but then I tried to be a little bit uh, fancy. So with unigrams, what, what I'm saying is that now, instead of like my likelihood is this, right? I'm gonna just treat it as a sum of uh, some of the, these people, right? So and it's the same principle here. I can then basically collect all the terms of the same. So that's W in V, right? And I look at this number of times W, I guess, okay, I'm gonna say this a little bit clearly, sort of number times W appears in corpus, right? So, so it's a number of times W appears in corpus. Well, it's sort of weird, um, times, log probability of W, right? Um, so, I mean, you know, let's be even more explicit here. Suppose my T1 to Tn is apples are two apples, right? Then what I'm doing is, you know, one, one, one of these terms here is going to be, you know, when W equals to apple, then the number of times of apple is going to be equal to two. And then so it would just be two times log probability that I probably that I'm going to sign to apple. 
Um, so, yeah, okay, so, so, okay, so ignore this for now. I'm gonna, that will be for your homework when I send this. Uh, this unigram should be much easier to explain. So let me just keep going. Um, okay, so yeah, so let me explain the unigram first and then we can go back to the other one. So in this case, you have the same thing here. What color was I using? Is this the color? Yeah. All right. So I've from here to here. Then finally, I can. Oh yeah. So, so yeah. Sorry. So then the the point is, I can then write this as v number times w over the total size of my vocabulary. Maybe it's a minus one or not times log of PW, right? And so then what I'm saying here is that, so, so this is the count of W divided by the total, this is not T, this is N, sorry. Sorry, I'm getting all my notations weirded, right? So this is looking at, looking at my joint, like looking at my likelihood, my log likelihood, I can de decompose like this. Right, I'm just gonna you know do log of apples plus log of probability of R plus log of probability of two plus log of probability of apples. Obviously, then I can just collect these two probability statements together, right? Um, and so you know, so so that's how you can do that. This step is just now I'm just gonna divide by n because obviously that doesn't matter. And then what I'm saying is that well, this is how if you if you look at Optimization. So if you look at, so if you do like the whole Lagrange multiplier thing, the choice of PW, so the sort of the maximizing choice of PW here is exactly W over N, which is just the frequency of W in my corpus, right? Yeah, so yeah, so here I am divided by N because I can just do that. Um, this divided by N is easier to see. This divided by uh, a number of W1 is a little bit trickier to see, but I'm actually gonna go through that in a little bit. So uh, I will skip this part for now. Um, yeah, so dividing, yeah, dividing by n doesn't matter because it's a, you know, you're, you're still figuring out what's the, your, 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 your arg max is not going to matter if I divide everything by n. Okay, but it's, but it's not as clear to see that from this approach here. So this, this one you have to do, you have to do a little bit more work, but it's the same principle. Okay, sorry. Should I should have just stuck with should have just stuck with the unigram. Okay. Um, moving on, maybe. Uh, any questions? What there were a bunch of questions. Um, okay. Is n the length of the text? Yeah. So here, n is the length of the text. And so number of w over n is just the relative frequency here. So, uh, I guess the equal sign is confusing. Okay, well, there are a lot of equal signs. Um, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> uh, well, we, we, can, we can work out this later. So. Oh, quick um, question. Yeah, sure. Can you can you provide some some more intuition as to why it's that particular choice of the probability of W that will maximize the log likelihood? Uh, yeah. So um, I was thinking about this. I, you know, you you can do the optimization. Um, it's I don't know if I have that good of an intuition here. Um, it, it's you know it, this relates to information theory where, I mean, we're gonna look at this later, where this is just the negative entropy and this sort of corresponds to the number of 
bits required to um so if, if you treat if you think of this guy uh oh if you, basically what we're looking at here is is a probability distribution um probability density sorry and then you're you're sort of taking the the log of the probability and that's the thing like this is like the expectation over the log of the probabilities um but yeah, so I don't particular I don't have a particularly intuitive answer to this. Um, this is just something you should know for one thing. Like this is important in information theory and in a lot of other areas where if you if you have a yeah you have these are parameters you're allowed to pick and you want to maximize this term uh, in this particular case and and these have to sum up to one then it's the case that you should just put this put this guy into there. Um, yeah, so maybe there, I, I feel like there might be an intuition. Uh, I don't have one off the top of my head, um, but it's so, in any case. So is, it, Sorry, so yeah. is it kind of like the, uh, the example we have when we're doing least squares, where if it's a least squares type thing, the average is that's the kind of intuition we should have. Where if you have a least squared optimization of a set of variables, the average is uh, is the optimum of a minimum. I'm just analog analogously, not so much exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so you know, so okay, so at a at a more high level, what you know, what we're trying to say is that like. If I have sum of pi times log of fi, well, let's say theta i, um, you know, from i to one to n, whatever, uh, and then I, I, you know, I am allowed to. My thetas are parameters, right? Um, such that they sum up to one, right? And, and the p's are are also probability density, so they sum up to one. Um, so yeah, so all, all I'm saying here is that uh, the, the optimal choice of the thetas that maximize this is theta i equal to pi. Um, that, that's really all I'm saying. Um, I don't know if, yeah, I'm, I, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't try to relate this to like the stuff we did before. This is just an information theory quantity that we're gonna be using. Um, there, there are a lot of intuitions like what this means in terms of information theory, in terms of like uh, channels and signal compression and stuff like that. Um, but here, all I'm saying is that the, the optimal choice of the theta is in this particular case, the, in, the what we're trying to pick is we're trying to pick the, the likelihood that we're gonna assign to a particular word. Uh, intuitively it sort of makes sense that you want to pick your likelihood to be at least, um, you, you want to be, uh, what was the word? Um, uh, proportional to your relative frequency, right? If you think about it, the, you know, the, more, the, the words that are, appear most in your data set, you wanna have a higher likelihood, right? Because then you, know, then you get this nice property that, well, those appear, the, the words that appear the, the most, then you're gonna give it a, you know, when you take the sum, it's gonna be a, a bigger sum. Right, so, so so you can sort of see that it should be, in some sense, proportional to, and then maybe you can probably make a claim that well, then if it's proportional to, then you take the right normalization, then it's going to be the same. Um, but that's yeah, I guess that's the intuition. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. Um, there's a lot to cover. <sighs> okay, so mm, okay, so why why okay, all right. So what, what was I talking about? You know, all, all I was talking about was just this. This is just the one line I was trying to bring up. Um, just showing you that if you start with the classes being the words, this is actually gonna give you the maximum likelihood. And then once you start merging classes together, merging words together, necessarily that will produce something with a smaller likelihood. And then the point is then you, you, know, you merge the classes together that give you the smallest reduction in your likelihood. Um, and so, so this is sort of what it looks like, right? So here you have your, you know, your sequence of words and then they're gonna start merging together. Um, 
the interesting thing here is that it's, you know, that's all I'm doing. I'm just, I'm, I'm merging words together that such that they reduce the likelihood, right? But just through this, I guess in, in some sense naive procedure, like just again, remember this is just a biogram model, right? Just through a biogram model, um, you're able to actually capture interesting relationships between the words, right? Uh, so, okay, so someone asked, how do you know when to stop merging classes? Um, so this is a good question. Um, Actually, so as I said before, uh, this you know this thing that we're trying to describe right now, this is called a class-based background model. For myself, I think of this more as a uh, it's it, it's it's almost like pedagogical, like this method. So so like you, I wouldn't use this in practice. So like you know, questions like actual computational questions about like oh when would you stop the class? Um, when, you know, when would you stop merging classes? Um, I don't think they're that important. Like what's more important is sort of what, like the fact that this method is able to actually merge words together that actually have some you know, synonymous meaning. Uh, but okay, to, to, actually, to actually answer your question, what you could do is, you know, you would, um, it's a little bit like the pruning, right? You would set, you know, you would basically uh, maybe merge your classes and then like, at the same time, you'd have like a holdout set where you're gonna measure what is known as the perplexity, which is what I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. It's like sort of you know, the performance of this language model uh, on data that it hasn't seen or just on the current training data, right? Um, and then you can measure that and that would be your sort of out of sample uh, test error. Um, but for now, I think like, yeah. So I, I think these are important questions, but I what, what I wanna, sort of emphasizes the fact that, you know, this procedure, again, all it's doing is it's, right, it's basically, you know, it's starting with every word in its own class, and then it's gonna start pairing words together such that they lead to the smallest reduction in likelihood. And it's only looking at pairs of words, right? It's only looking at pairs of words in your, uh, in your corpus. Um, and it's, you know, it's somewhat surprising that it's able to capture these clusters, I feel. Um, right. Uh, I mean, maybe it's not particularly exciting. Maybe it's not particularly surprising. Um, but sort of the key point is that, you know, the surprising thing that is that this is only, as I said, the emphasis here is this only looking at biograms, right? This is literally only looking at pairs of words next to each other. And through that process, you know, even though you know, the, the calculations are all done through looking at words next to each other, it's able to capture something that is you know, a little bit more complicated than just local information, right? It's like, so, so, okay, a better, better way to say it is that just looking at local statistics of pairs of words, and obviously, you know, because you're looking at pairs of words, they sort of chain up together. So in some sense, you're actually looking at words that are somewhat close together. Um, but just through looking at these local statistics, are you able to capture interesting, um, you know, clusterings about the actual words themselves, right? So, you know, as you said here, so these clusters actually contain a lot of syntactic and semantic elements, right? So, Syntactic is, you know, this idea that well, th these are contractions, and it's able to recognize that maybe these contractions are somehow used interchangeably, maybe, or, 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 or you know, they have some uh, uh, redundancies, so to speak. Um, but yeah, and so this is actually one of the key. Um, this is basically like the the mantra of natural language processing, um, right? So, so like whenever you look at these like talks by people who do NLP, like this is one of the first phrases that like they put on their slides. It's like a word is known by the company it keeps, right? So, and this is the same, it's sort of like what we're talk, talking about topic models. And, and this is basically, we're gonna, this whole philosophy is what drives all of NLP, which is that like, I don't need to know the meanings of the words, right? Remember, 
I don't know the meanings of any of these words. All I know, all, all the way I understand a word is not by the meaning, but just by what are the words around it, right? So it's this idea of like the local co-occurrences of words around this particular word. That's how I know what a word means in some sense. Or like, yeah, like what, what like, yeah, exactly. Okay, so, and, and so, so as I said, like, this is really, this is so different from what we were talking about in the first half of the class, right? And, and I would say this is much more hand wavy. Um, Right, like in the first half of class, it's 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 very mathematical, linear algebra. You know, you have some data set. You know, you have some very simple algorithm. Well, not simple algorithm, but it's very principled, right? Because you're dealing with words. You know, you maybe you assume some Gaussianity or whatever. Sorry, you're dealing with numbers and you assume some Gaussianity and noise and whatever. Here, we're dealing with the fuzzy notion of like words themselves, and there's no, you know, a prior reason why these words should have some structure. Obviously they do, given the way we talk and the grammatical structure and the stuff like that. But like, yeah, it's much more fuzzy. And this is actually why I really like this, this topic because like, um, it's, it's a lot more in intuition based and like sort of, yeah, weird, things like this. Okay, sorry, ramble. Over. Um, okay, so, so, okay, so yeah, so I said before, uh, it's actually gonna be helpful to think of this in terms of information theory. Um, you know, this should be familiar to you. This is what we were just saying just then, where this is, you know, basically a lot of times, if you're going, if you're looking at the MLE, um, just if you have empirical frequencies of the particular data sets that you have, then this is basically similar to the negative en entropy given by the empirical distribution that you just saw, okay? Um, so this is the same quantity that we saw just then. Um, this is another quantity, um, it's called the average mutual information. Uh, and the way, you know, I'm not gonna go through the, you know, the formulas themselves. Um, we're actually gonna use them in a little bit, but the key point here is to look at this final interpretation, right? So entropy is sort of like, the sort of the information content of a random variable, right? Um, so if, if if things are difficult to compress, then they're going to have high entropy, right? And so here you you have two random variables x one and x two, and you know, and the whole idea is that you want to use you want to use x one to to predict x two, right? So if you look at the average mutual information. Well, you can, it turns out that this is equal to the entropy of X2 minus the entropy of the, the random variable X2 given X1, right? So what that means is it's sort of like measuring how much the reduction in entropy in X2 comes if I told you about X1, right? So, it's, so, so, so for instance, if X1 and X2 were independent, then basically, obviously, knowing x1 doesn't help you to know x2, right? Because they're independent. And so it, it, it's some measure of like correlation, but, but this is just an information theoretic way of thinking about it. Um, okay, so you can write the formulas down if you want, but we're actually going to uh, sort of, in some sense, derive this, okay? Uh, well, no, not this page. Yeah. Okay, so what I want is this page here, All right? So I'm gonna show this slide here because um, I think it's actually uh, informative in some sense. All right, so what, so remember what we're talking about are these class-based models, right? And I'm gonna pick a particular clustering, right? A particular clustering is basically equivalent to a partition of the vocabulary, right? So suppose I have my vocabulary, one to V, a clustering is just, you know, suppose I move my words around such that they're all in the same cluster, then it's just going to be, you know, like that, right? So this this would be, let's say, yeah, well, I'm not gonna give examples, but a clustering is basically a, a, a partition of my, of my vocabulary, okay? Um, anyway, th this is just 
this is, this is actually not that important. Um, so I, I want to derive this um, and then we'll sort of describe what this actually is. Okay. Um, so th this part hopefully will be, uh, so okay. I went through that a little bit quickly because I want to actually go through the derivation first and then we can revisit what this, what, what, what they all mean, right? So, so let's just start from basically start, start from first principles. What we had before was we had this log likely, oh, I don't want to use this color. We had this log likelihood, right? It's given by log of probability of T1 to T n, right? So this is the same thing, right? So the same setup, I'm looking at the log likelihood of my corpus, right? Um, and I'm gonna again use the bigram model. So this is just sum from one to n of log of p ti over ti minus one. All right. Okay. So still the same thing as last time. I've just you know this is this is the whole bigram model. Okay. And now we're gonna do the same thing we did before, which is I'm going to basically now rewrite this as w1, w2 times the number of w1, w2 over log p w2 over w1. Okay, so this is again still the same thing as we had before, so hopefully this is fine. All right, so remember to go from this guy to this guy is just basically I'm merging the terms that are exactly the same, right? Every time I see two words next to each other, like, you know, United States, if I see the, those two words in the corpus next to each other, then obviously this term is gonna be the same because you know, the parameters are all the same. So then I can just collect them, right? So then I'm iterating over all pairs of words in my vocabulary and I can count them up like that. Cool. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna then introduce the definition of the class-based bigram model, right? Remember the classic bigram model is given by probability of W1 given C2 times probability of C2, oops, he's C2 given C1, All right? So that's just definition, right? So if you remember before, that's what we looked at when we first to find this class based model, you're going to replace the words with the classes themselves. Okay. And then a little bit of algebra is going to give me, I keep writing it like that W1, W2, log of P, W2, WC1, right, plus. W1, W2, oh my God. W1, W2, log of P, C2 over C1, over P, C2. All right, so what did I do just then? I basically multiplied this by P of C2, divided this by P of C2, All right? And then obviously because it's in a log, I can take the sum and that's what I have. Questions so far? Yeah, this is uh, two class. Uh, no, uh, no. So, okay, sorry. Yeah. So let me be a little bit clear here. So, um, C two is the class for W two. Sorry. Sorry. I I should be explicit here. Right, yeah. So so this is just a shorthand form of C two is really the class of W2. Right, so here uh, it could be, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've i specified a, you know, you remember here, I've specified a partition already. So, you know, there are multiple classes. I, I don't need to specify how many classes there are, but all I care about is for a particular word in my vocabulary, what is the class that's assigned to that? 
what class is that word assigned to? Okay, let me be, okay. Let me be a little bit slower, sorry. Here we go. So let me just give you an example. Okay, so apples is to apples, right? This is T1, this is T2, this is T3, this is T4. Right, so now I have W1, W2, W3. Well, that's apples is two, All right? So this is my vocab. And then I'm gonna have a class. Let's say I pick, I pick these to be in one class and I pick this guy to be in another class. Therefore, my C1 is yellow, which I'm gonna call one. Uh, C2 is, since it's is, it's also yellow. So that's one. C3 is two, which is green. So that's two. Okay, so, so the Cs here are related to the Ws. Okay, okay, so in, in this particular case, yes, it is a uh, two class model, but you know, it doesn't have to be. Okay. Make sense? Everyone follow? Sorry, why is C3 oh. two instead of one? Like, is that green's two? You wrote that, C3 is green two. Yeah, yeah, so, I, so what I'm saying here is that like, uh, you know, C3, which is the class for words, which is class for the third word in the vocab, which is two, I've set it to be in a, its own class. So I've, you know, here I'm just labeling the classes differently, right? So, so I've just set yellow to be the class one, the green to be oh, class okay. two. Yeah, yeah that's, that's all I meant. Okay. Everyone, do, do, do. okay, so yeah, so then that, okay, so then <laughs> let me just go through this a little bit again. I have my likelihood, I have my decomposition because of the background model. I can then collect the terms together. This is just from the definition of this class based background model. This is just by multiplying and dividing by P of probability of C2. Okay, so. All is good. Okay. So question, well, I'm gonna call this term A, I'm gonna call this term B. So let's look at A. Um, who can tell me what, can anyone, uh, who can tell me if, this guy can be simplified. And if, if so, to what? Maybe, okay, okay. Oh, cool. Nice. Uh, yeah, I, I, okay, so someone by the name of 14109, I wish, I wish you had your name, whatever. Um, so number guy, uh, Yes, exactly. Uh, it's a little weird because I'm, you know, I'm thinking in terms of words and classes, but like intuitively, it sort of makes sense because, you know, probability of W2 is like the probability of picking W2, whereas probability of C2 is the probability of picking the whole class, right? But that obviously includes W2. So the event W2 is obviously subsumed by the event C2, well, whichever way around it was. Um, and so this is actually just gonna be probability of W2, All right? Okay, so I remember here, yeah, here we're already dealing with like the, 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 the frequencies of these things, All right? So what does A then, 
boil down to? Well, then this just boils down to probably a one, W2, W1, W2, log of probably two. Right. So then if I uh, do a little bit of finagling, I can then write this as W2 over W1, sum of W1, W2, log of PW2. And then I'm going to divide everything by N. Right. Uh, either n or n minus one, uh, it's not that big of a deal. Um, and so here, it you want to look at this quantity. Um, so, uh, what? Um, what does this quantity sort of correspond to, right? So what are we saying here? This is basically looking at the sum uh, across all words of the total joint count of W1 and W2, right? Um, so, what this ends up being, you know, so if you look at this in the limit, this ends up basically looking just like, well, ends up approximating approximately equal to probability of W2. Um, so yeah, so this, maybe it takes a little bit time to, to see this, but um, for now, I'm not gonna, spend too much time on this, but you can sort of show that, you know, if you take this sort of in the limit, this sort of looks a little bit like the probability of W2. Um, okay. So there's a little bit of hand waving going on there. Uh, then what you get is like, this is approximately sum of W2 of probably W2 log of probably W2. Well, voila, that's exactly my H of W, right? Remember W2 is just a index over the words, right? So this is just the negative entropy, which was the first term that we saw in the uh, uh, slides, negative W, um, right? So I dropped the two here because remember, this is just W1, W2 are just indices over the words in my vocabulary. So I can just do that. Right, so this is just the entropy of the, the words, the way I've defined them, right? Um, then I have my second term here, which is B. Um, if, you, if you do this, B, if you look at the definition of the mutual information, you can actually, well, let me just work through this a little bit. What B is this guy here. The key thing to note is that this is actually equal to C1, C2, sum of oops, C1, C2, log of PC2, C1 over PC2. Um, so why can I, replace this with this. It's simply because, so you remember what, what we're doing here is we're basically collecting the counts for things, right? Um, but the, the point is that if, if W1 and W2 are, because the only other term relates to the Cs, actually every time W1 and W2 are in C1 and C2, then this term is going to be the same. So it's actually a sum over the classes themselves. And so you get this instead. So, so this is a sort of a, a second collecting of terms. Right? You collect the terms where C1 and C2 are the same for the W1 and W2. 
Okay, so once you look at this, then if you check back on your notes, you can see that this is essentially modulo a term one on n. This is essentially C one C two. So this is like the mutual information between C one and C two. Okay, uh, yeah. So. Oh, okay, I, I was debating whether or not I wanted to go through this um, because it's a little bit uh, crude, but I, the, the main reason I, I wanted to go through this, I wanted you to sort of see what, the, sort of what, you know, what I'm talking about when I mean the likelihood and, and how you can derive it. Um, the key point of this is that what you get out of this is this equation, right? And so, okay, well, First of all, does anyone have any questions about? Okay, I assume people have questions about this, but um, besides the stuff where I was fudging, uh, are there any like high level? I'm very lost. Can you clarify something? Questions? Um, um, so, are there only two classes? I, I might have missed that. I think you talked about this, but. You know, you say C1, C2, but couldn't there be like more than two classes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. So here, C1 and C2 correspond to the class of W1 and W2 in like in this particular case, right? So, so, so here, here, when I, when I, when I say C2, I, I just mean the class of W2. Mm -hmm. So it's a little, it's, this is sort of confusing. Um, yeah, like every time, like every time you see C two, you should you think, think class of W two. So it's like a, it's just the class that it belongs to. Um, and so then, if we look through this, um, you know, so this part is still fine. This is still class of W two. This is class of W two, class of W one. And then what that means is, well, in this particular case, if I pick W1 and W2 such that they still fall into the same class, and then it doesn't matter, right? Because I'm, I'm still, it's, this is gonna be the still same probability. I'm measuring the probability of you know, this class being followed by that next class. But if the classes don't change, then the term is still the same. Okay. Yeah. When you run this, model like when you do the work do you pre-specify the number of classes ahead of time or does the no, system no. generate that yeah so so this is uh this is this step where is it right so um so it's it's gonna do it's gonna it's gonna basically start from every word in its own class and it's gonna basically start merging the words together so it's such that they form like a, you know it's like a, it's like an upside down tree so you know every word is in own class, and then you start branching up and up and up, and until like the extreme is every word is in one class, right? Um, so that this is this is why you see stuff like this, right? So this is literally, um, you know, in this case, I've merged question and charge into the same class. So there's no specification of a number of classes. It's just you you get to pick at some point where do you want to stop, right? So if you stop here, then all these words are in one class, for instance. Right? Um, so, for for this particular derivation, I've just said, let's just fix a let's just fix a particular clustering. Right? So I've I've grouped every word into a particular class, and then I've just fixed that partition. I'm going to look at the likelihood. So right. the math. The math is a little bit different, but I, I was asking because there's a way if you kind of like specify a range of classes in some way, then the words could look like what you get from the topic model. So like all talk, like words that are in the same overall general class, you could in some way think of them like a topic that the model has all classified. So is it is that the right kind of analogous thinking or there's something fundamentally different that even though the output looks the same, they are actually different? So, yeah, so I will say that um, they're similar in the sense that we're doing some sort of clustering type analysis. Like, yeah, it's like, you know, with topics, you're finding words that appear together, right? So it's a similar process, it's a similar intuition. Obviously the actual mechanics of it are completely different, right? 
Um, but it's a similar intuition that basically you're looking at words that appear together. Uh, here, I don't have documents, right? I only have one really, really long, you know, I concatenate all of Wikipedia into one long text. So, you know, there are no documents. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not taking advantage of documents, but it's still a similar notion of like finding words that are close together, maybe. I, I mean, okay, it's very different. I mean, there are so many ways that it's different, but in some sense, you're doing something similar in the sense that you're doing clustering of words. Yeah. Okay. Okay, but, okay. So the takeaway from this slide is that what you're going to do is you're going to, the intuition behind the classic model is that for a particular partition, the likelihood is gonna give, it's gonna be given by this equation. And obviously this term doesn't depend on your partition. The only thing that depends on the partition is this guy. And if you remember, what is this? This is the average mutual information, right? And truly what's, what's that saying is that it's trying to say, I wanna pick C1 and C2 to be such that it's C1 is very helpful in predicting C2, right? So this is the whole idea, which is that like, you want to pick these, you want to pick these classes such that the, uh, you know, the, because we're doing a biogram model, I want the class, the previous class to be informative for the next class. Okay. Um, all right, so let's move on because uh, this is not, I think probably we're getting behind a little bit <laughs> again. Um, so what is this? This is just looking at the, I'm looking at like the uh, the joint likelihood, right? So this is, a this is the decomposition. Essentially, this is a way of measuring uh, the, sort of the performance, right? This is just the, the likelihood. Um, but then obviously you take the one over one over one on N to the power. Um, and so this is just a measure of how good your model is at, you know, guessing you, you like you ultimately you want your sentences to be likely, right? If you see a sentence, you want it to be likely because then your model will have guessed that because it's, you know, it's a given sentence. It actually should be likely given your model, right? Um, Okay, so what you can show is that compared to the sort of the most naive thing where you have uh, the MLE model, um, but then you have a whole bunch of parameters there. If you do this class based model where you're doing a little bit of clustering, you can actually reduce the size of your model quite considerably uh, with, a, with a very little loss in terms of like perplexity, right? So again, perplexity intuitively is just you're just looking at the joint distribution of your your words, right? Of, of your corpus. It could either be a whole held out corpus or be just the existing corpus that you're dealing with. Um, okay. Uh, so I wanna go over this a little bit because, uh, well, this slide would be helpful for you for your homework. Um, so what we were just looking at was the average mutual information, right? But we were looking at it for, um, classes, you know, C1 and C2, you can look at something similar for just words, like word one and word two, right? If you think of word one and word two as sort of the probabilities associated with, you know, the previous word and the next word, right? Then you can calculate the average mutual, mutual information there. And that's really related to the idea of like, well, which words are gonna be following which other words, right? So, um, what will what you can what you'll see in your uh, homework is that you can sort of use this as a as a way of getting at these co-occurrences in your data set as well. Um, so we'll look at this in a little bit. Um, so, but the point of this is that like you want to you're trying to find words that just appear together, right? So. The idea is like, so for instance, if I, if, if your W1 was Humpty, right? Then you're, you're basically guaranteed that your W2 is 
Well, I actually don't know how to spell Humpty Dumpty. I think that's right, right? So you're, you're almost guaranteed that your double two is going to be Dumpty, right? So, you know, so uh, in this paper on this class-based model, these are called sticky pairs of words, right? So you want to find these kinds of words because then that means that W1 is giving you almost all the information you need to guess W2, right? Um, and so like, this is sort of getting at a type of statistic that you sort of want to be maximizing. You want to, you know, you want to find the words that are really sticky and then you want to assign a high probability, a high likelihood to these kinds of words. Um, okay, so we'll go through this in the homework. Um, let me just, okay. I haven't even gone through language models. Uh, this is okay, whatever. Okay, so I want to just give you a hint as to uh, why these class-based models are not great, right? So if you think about what this class-based model is doing, is it's basically doing a clustering, right? So I, you know, I have these words, and I'm going to lump them together into a group, right? Maybe they're days of the week. They're like uh, adverbs, they're descriptions or like, you know, houses or whatever, right? But clearly each of the words in these groups have different meaning, right? Like there are several differences between them. And so if you, if you cluster them into one category, obviously that's very crude, right? So what you want, you know, what you want to take advantage of this is you want to take advantage of basically high dimensional actual, you know, Euclidean space, right? So instead of associating each word with a class label, the intuitive thing you could do is let's associate each word with a vector in some space, right? And then, well, you can still get back this clustering idea because what you have is, you know, suppose I have these vectors in space, some vectors here, obviously let's see, you know, it's going to be a high dimensional space, right? But if, if I think this clustering approach is actually useful, this still gives me that because then what you could do is you could just have, you know, this region in your space corresponding to a particular cluster, right? So, so this is a much more, you know, general way of thinking about this where you can, you can still get this notion of like, oh, let's have words close together uh, but now I just have them close in, you know, in this high dimensional space, right? Um, so, so really what we're going to do is we're going to basically try to think in terms of words as actually just going to be a vector, it's, but it's going to be actually the parameters of my model, right? So I'm actually going to learn the parameters of my model and these parameters will correspond to the position in this high dimensional space that we're going to be uh, using, right? So, so I, yeah, so, so the reason why we spend this much time on this class wave mo model is that I think what, okay, so first of all, it, it, you know, we introduced this notion of a language model where we're trying to predict, uh, you know, the next word given the previous set of words. And we look at this idea of, well, maybe, you know, because the fact that you have these synonyms and you have this structure of words in terms of the definitions, you might do well by clustering them together, right? But that's sort of crude. So what you could do, and it seems to be somewhat intuitive, is let's just instead treat each word as a, as a, you know, a length D vector. And the intuition is that we'll still get the same clusters potentially, or maybe we'll do even better. But we'll still get the same clusters because you could just do like a K-means clustering in this high dimensional space, right? And so the original clusters you learn from this class space model, you expect them to basically lie in the same space, region of space in your high dimensional um, space, right? But now what you have is because you can represent these as vectors, you can do interesting vector operations. Um, so in your homework, you'll actually look at these things where you can show that these word vectors are actually you know, satisfy the, the analogies that we understand, okay? Um, yeah, so a brief 
hint as to what we're going to do, right? It's actually like, okay, it sounds really complicated. It's like, yeah, we're now going to talk about, new, it's almost like a neural network. So it's going to be a neural language model, right? But the actual process is not too tricky because all it is, is basically I'm going to say, I'm going to associate every word instead of a one hard encoding, I'm going to associate every word with a D dimensional vector, right? In this case, I'm going to call it C of W, right? This is a D dimensional vector. And I'm actually going to just treat each entry of my vector as a parameter. And this, this is a parameter that I'm going to learn, right? So what I have is I have V words, I have D dimensions for each word. So really what I'm looking at is a V by D matrix, right? There's this, it's naturally very big. It's a huge matrix, it's huge matrix of parameters, but that's actually the things I'm gonna learn, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically try to, you know, I'm gonna think about this likelihood function, right? And I'm gonna use these parameters as, these parameters are gonna basically be, uh, it, through some process, I'm gonna use them as predictions for guessing what the probability of the next word is going to be, right? And actually it's just gonna be a humongous logistic regression. Um, so, you know, okay, we're gonna talk about this next class because I, I feel like I'm just being very hand wavy here. Um, you know, the, <laughs> the model looks like this. It's actually a lot easier than what this diagram suggests. Um, but sort of some takeaways from this just at a high level is that is you're just going to use stochastic gradient descent. You're learning a language model, which basically means what you're trying to do is you're trying to, given previous, you know, let's assume a bigram model, given the previous word, I want to guess the next word as well as I can, right? And I'm going to set up a, a logistic regression that involves these word parameters that I've just described. Okay, any questions? Um, okay, I'm sure, I'm sure you guys have questions. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I spent a little too, too much time on the uh, derivation of the map. Um, I'm also realizing I'm just like slowing down. So we're getting through less of the material. Um, so I, you know, de depends on how things look, I might have to like postpone stuff. Um, Cause yeah, we're just not going through it fast enough. Well, I, at the same time, like I don't want to rush through things now because I had, you know, we have less interaction. So I would prefer to go through, through things slower, um, but yeah. Okay, well, Again, I'll be here uh, for a little while and uh, you guys can leave or stay.